Okay, welcome back. This is the video for those of you that are interested in studying Southwold's coastal geography. We've got a nice picture of Southwold's beach there. And uh, there's lots of different aspects that you can investigate if this was the angle that you wanted to approach your investigation with. So uh, in this video, we're going to, first of all, try to explain a little bit more about Southwold's coastline. Um, I'll also introduce you to the main kind of challenges and, and threats that the coastline poses Southwold. And then towards the second part of this video, I'm going to spend some time talking about the actual coastal field work that you can do um, in our location and on this stretch. One of the things that you will need, and I'd suggest that you perhaps dig out if you haven't done already, is your um, booklet, your support booklet that you might have a hard copy of, or it might be an electronic version. But I'll refer to that quite often throughout the course of the presentation, so it's useful if at this stage you could dig that out. OK, just a reminder that uh, this is one of a series of videos. Uh, the first one that you've hopefully watched was the introductory video. It's difficult to say that, introductory. Uh, virtual video one as our introduction to the NEA. And then you had a choice of whether you're going to perhaps focus on a human study or maybe more of a physical coastal study. That's what this video is. This is virtual video three. And the plan for this video is to introduce you to Southwold's physical geography and also to give you some more confidence on the physical fieldwork methods that you can use. At the end of this video, then, uh, I would suggest that all of you, whether you're doing human or physical, will also spend a bit of time just watching the final video we'll put together, virtual video four. And that will talk through a bit more about how you actually go about designing your studies and um, designing your methodologies and your grids and things like that. OK, so first of all, I would say good choice. Um, picking to investigate Southwold's coastline is a pretty good choice because this is a town that has got a really varied coastline, a really interesting coastline, and conveniently as well, a coastline that does all sorts of things in a really compact distance. Um, to kind of explain what I mean by that, from where we are looking here at the pier, um, all the way down to, you can see the end of those groins. There are six groins that you can see, those those wooden groins. Um, just beyond that is a, a section of what looks like kind of grassy land. That's the beginning of Southwold's Dunes, um, Southwold's Dean's Beach, that's known as. But we've got a stretch of about a kilometre south from Southwold Pier, looking off into the distance there, um, which is managed by a policy of hard engineering with wooden groins and the sea wall. So we've got a stretch of a kilometre there, which is really easy to walk up and down. It's probably about a 10, 15 minute walk from the pier to the end of the Southwold sea wall by those dunes. Uh, and the bulk of you, I imagine, who are doing coastal studies will be working kind of fundamentally in that zone, in that area. Some of you may choose to go down to the dunes end as well. Some of you might choose to come into the foreground of that image and work on the beach um, where the rock groins are located, part of the beach known as North Beach. But this is a town that very clearly, as you can see from that image, is managed. So there's a, there's a, there is definitely obvious evidence of coastal management going on there. Um, hopefully you'll be able to notice that those groins look as if they're being you know, relatively effective at um, holding some of the sand in place. So that suggests to us that you know, longshore drift is probably operating along this coastline as, as well operating probably um, based on that evidence towards us uh, and that's in a kind of a south to north direction so it looks as if longshore drift is operating so we've got you know coastal processes happening here you perhaps can't tell from the image but the sea in Southwold and the sea generally along the east coast is quite murky sometimes people are a bit disappointed when they come to the time and they're expecting almost kind of like Cornish or De uh, Devonshire uh, crystal clear water. It's not like that in the East, East Anglian coastline. It's quite murky. And part of the reason for that really is that there's so much sand suspended in the water here that um, the, the the water itself is, is quite cloudy because there is so much kind of suspended material of mud and, and sand and fine particles. And that in itself then suggests that this is a coastline that has obviously got erosion and has got transportation. And obviously the fact that there is a beach there in the uh, in the front of the town suggests that there's also you know to an extent some deposition going on as well so we've got obvious signs just from this picture just from a 
you know, kind of from a geographical perspective, looking at this image here, that we've got erosion, we've got transportation, we've got deposition, but we've also got coastal management. We've got hard coastal management in front of the town, the seawall, the rock and wooden groins. And then in the distance, we've got an area where there is a more soft approach where we're using sand dunes. You might actually be able to see that beyond those sand dunes, you have what almost looks like a big chunk taken out of the coastline where there's almost a bay beyond Southwold Harbour. Well, in that bay um, was a town called Dunwich. And Dunwich used to be a really important East Anglian port. Um, but over centuries of coastal erosion, it's actually fallen completely into the sea. It was in effect a, a kind of a city for, for many years. Um, and that kind of um, historic city has now almost pretty much been lost to coastal erosion. So this is a stretch of very dynamic coastline where coastal management is important because of the coastal processes that are going on in this location. So there's definitely a lot to investigate, and I think it's a very appropriate place, place for coastal um, fieldwork investigations. You might look at it, though, and you might look at this kind of image and um, think, well, it doesn't look as if it's a place that is going to be affected by coastal erosion because the waves look as if they're non-existent. And actually, quite often on the East Anglian coast, you will come out onto the beach and you'll think, yeah, those waves are pretty minor, pretty, pretty um, unpowerful and, and not anything. And they almost just kind of lap at the shore. And generally, nine times out of ten, if you were to come onto um, a Suffolk beach, that's that's the case. The, the waves here generally are not all that powerful because there isn't much of a fetch between us and the Netherlands and, and mainland Europe on most occasions. But when the weather and the wind and our you know our systems approach from the north then there is a big fetch stretching all the way up to the Arctic. And um, when we do get those kind of northerly swells and northerly weather systems, we do get big, you know, powerful waves that can really beat away at the uh, East Anglian coastline. And the next video, hopefully, will be able to demonstrate that to you. Very sad. So that video just kind of shows that actually, you know, on occasions, South Wold and the East Anglian coast can definitely be impacted by big, violent seas. They're not the predominant weather systems that we would expect to see here, and we don't tend to see big waves happening all that often. But when those weather systems do roll in from the north and the Arctic, um, then actually the kind of the vulnerable and fragile um, East Anglian coast can rapidly be eroded. On the screen here are some pictures taken from 1905. And you can see that actually there is fairly obvious evidence of recent erosion going on here. Uh, these are pictures taken from Southwold, and uh, these are places that you will go to because actually if I put on a couple of other pictures, you can see on the bottom of the screen here, there are two pictures that are taken in exactly the same spot. Um, those two that are taken on that kind of promenade walkway above the, the beach there where you can see the, the bin in that new picture that's arrived in colour. Um, those are taken in exactly the same location, but over a hundred years apart. In 1905, Southwold was being eaten away by coastal erosion, mainly because it wasn't being defended resiliently enough. And the kind of fairly primitive coastal defences that Southwold had at that time were just not sufficient enough to keep those big winter storms at bay. So Southwold used to use a kind of a fairly basic combination of timbers and, and um, you know, kind of wooden structures in front of the cliffs to defend themselves from, from the sea. Uh, but in big violent storms, those weren't weren't sufficient and they would be uh, kind of penetrated. And you can see that picture top left there shows how those kind of initial wooden sea defences were just not um, strong enough to hold back the, the power of the sea at times. In 1905, as I said, there was a particularly big storm that or, you know, huge chunks of the cliff all of a sudden, uh, almost overnight, kind of falling away onto the beach. So it's a place that is definitely at risk and if left exposed Southwold would over time have been you know fairly largely eroded away the reason for this as you can see by that kind of second picture on the top row there is because 
fundamentally, the, the, the geology that Southwold sits on, the rock that Southwold sits on is weak. It's a combination of sandstone and a type of clay, and uh, both of those types of rock are pretty feeble in terms of standing up to the power of water. And there are places where those rocks are exposed in a place called Eastern Baden, which is north of Southwold, where there aren't sea defences. And you can just go up the rocks and kind of scrape away at them and they just disintegrate. So when a big storm is smashing against them, you can over overnight literally see large parts of the cliff kind of tumble onto the beach and, and uh, rapid erosion happen. Um, on average in Southwold and along the East Anglian coast, there is a three to five metres worth of erosion rate where hard engineering doesn't exist. So in particular, the area between Eastern Badlands and Lowestoft, which is north of Southwold, along that stretch of coast, Environment Agency have recorded that there is an expected three to five metres worth of erosion that will occur per year. So Southwold is at risk from coastal erosion primarily because of the weak geology that the town sits on, a combination of sand and clay. OK, so hopefully one of the things that you might have studied already to do with your um, A-level in geography are these things called shoreline management plans. And shoreline management plans are basically local documents that outline how the coastline of a particular place is managed. Because all around the coastline of the UK, there is a plan as to how that coastline is managed in all of those different areas. Now, in some locations, the plan is literally to leave that area as it is and to leave it undefended, because obviously we can't afford to build a seawall around the whole um, country. But also we need some places that are eroded because that's where our source of material comes for beaches. So hopefully just by looking at that image again of Southwold, that you can see that, you know, it looks as if the plan in Southwold is to try and protect the town. And obviously that's what the seawall is, is fundamentally trying to do. So we have the seawall, we have a combination of rock and wooden groins, and the plan for Southwold, as you can see on that little document that I've got there, so there is a short there is a shoreline management plan for Suffolk. The main thing that you need to know about is that the plan for this area is to continue to hold the line and protect the town and its properties for the long term. So the seawall is holding the line literally of the coastline. That's where the local authorities have agreed that this is where Southwold's coastline is going to stand and stay and the seawall is going to try and keep it in place at that exact location for the long term into the future. So that's what the seawall is designed to do, is to prevent future coastal erosion and the kind of the recession of the coastline back and back into the town. The groins then, their job is kind of twofold really. So the job of the groins is to try and protect and prevent longshore drift, but at the same time to create and maintain beach levels and ensure that there is a kind of public asset, the beach that is in front of the town, which offers a first line of defence um, against erosion, but also obviously offers this kind of tourist facility. It's one of the things that people want to do when they come to a coastal town is, is actually go onto the beach. So Southwold is defended in those two ways, by using groins to maintain and kind of build up the sand levels and um, by using a seawall to literally kind of hold the line erosion. So I mentioned earlier that the majority of you when you come to Southwold if you're doing coastal studies will be investigating largely I would have thought this location the town beach. Town beach as I said stretches from a kilometre from the pier all the way down to the dunes. There are eight wooden groins on the town beach but actually there's probably only six of those that are really visible. And actually only those, the first three of those that you can see closest to the pier, potentially four, are ones which are measurable because the other ones, the ones that are further south, are actually almost completely swallowed up by sand. And in, to an extent, you could argue they're being really effective because they have caught as much sand as they possibly can. The extent that the sand is kind of piled up right to the top of those groins on both sides. Now, there are three or four groins where that hasn't quite happened, and you will see that there's a kind of a variation in sand levels on either side of the groins on the town beach. But that's town beach, and it's defended, as, as I mentioned before, by uh, the seawall and a combination of wooden groins. OK, this is just to give you, again, just a bit more perspective as to what town beach is like. Um, obviously, you guys haven't benefited from coming 
spending a day to kind of orientate yourself with the town and get familiar with it. So hopefully, you know, the next few images and the next few slides will help you do this. This is the town beach then, um, looking from a slightly different angle to the one that you've seen before. Um, I mentioned that some of the groins on town beach are almost swallowed by the sand and two in the main picture here in the foreground that you might just be able to see just those kind of lines of stumps in the sand. Those are actually groins there. Um, you can see that white car on the seafront there on the uh, seawall bet between um, that white car kind of north and south of where it's parked. Those, there are two groins on the beach there. But you know, as I say, they, they're barely evident because of the amount of sand that has built up on either side of them. As you move further north to the northern end, you can see that the beach tapers in, gets narrower, and the groins become a little bit more prominent and more evident. And that's because there's less sand at that end. And um, it's more obvious that the groins at that point are kind of affecting um, the movement of sand, preventing it going further north. At the opposite end of Town Beach, um, slightly different day when this was taken, you can see it's a bit cloudier here. Uh, this is the point that's worth knowing, it's the, the point that separates Town Beach and Dean's Beach. There's a beach cafe there underneath the word Gun Hill. You can see Gun Hill, I think I mentioned in the first video, is a place in Southport where there's some pretty grand big houses, um, very wealthy and, and kind of expensive houses up here on Gun Hill. To the right of the word Gun Hill, you might be able to see cannons dotted along the top of the front there. Um, that's probably where the name Gun Hill comes from. Um, below the word gun, you can see a big blue beach hut. Well, that's actually Gun Hill Beach, which is a cafe, useful to know about. And um, just behind that are some toilets as well, which is also quite useful to know about. Um, but this point here in front of the cafe is literally the start of South Bold Sea Wall. Um, and at that point, it doesn't look like much, pretty much looks like a pavement really because you can walk off the um, the seawall at that point and go right onto the beach without kind of even noticing any difference in in height at all you can literally just step onto the beach off the seawall but that suggests to us that this end has got lots of sand there is a lot of sand at the the gun hill end of town beach um, and that sand is accumulated right up against the top of the seawall and it means that at this end as well there's a long wide stretch of beach as well this is um, probably the most Instagrammable part of Southwold. You can see those beach huts on the main image there to the left um, of the screen. Those beach huts sit right onto the sand and behind them they've got these, these um, sand dunes, marram grass growing against them. And on a nice sunrise or sunset they look pretty attractive and um, lots of Southwold postcards have those, um, those beach huts on but they're often the spot that people want to come and get their selfies in front of and uh, take pictures of. So uh, this part of the town is, is very popular. Uh, it's very kind of civilized. And if you were to kind of assess the mood or the environmental quality here, generally this place scores pretty highly. It's a very kind of um, relaxed environment. Sometimes there can be live music here in the summer, but al almost always when it's not raining, the weather's good. You've got lots of people kind of mingling, hanging around, drinking coffee uh, and uh, lots of dogs running wild here as well. <laughs> OK, so that's the, the southern end of Town Beach. So one of the things that I think is definitely worth me spending just a few moments trying to explain to you guys is our understanding of what's happening along the South Wales coastline, because actually every stretch of coastline around the country is slightly different in terms of what's happening. And although there are lots of theories about um, coastal behaviour and things like coastal processes and sediment cells and things like that, the reality is, is that there isn't one size fits all approach and every stretch of the coastline has got different influences that affects how that coastline behaves. Now, one of the things that I've benefited from in the last 15 years or so of working along South Wales coastline is I've seen it change over time and I see it change during the seasons as well. But there are always things that students ask me that actually I can't answer because it's important to understand that the sea is one mass of energy and that energy is driven by a number of different things that are quite difficult to understand. So things like the tides, things like weather systems, and things like the wind on the day and swell that happens over the previous days as well. So there are a number of different forces that shape the behavior of that water. And generally, 
it behaves in a, a kind of a, a, a normal way. But there are certain times when there are other things that happen that change what's happening in terms of the behavior of Southwold's, um, Southwold's team. So what I try to do is um, I try to every so often get in contact with the local environment agency representative. This is a, a chap called Hornwood. You can see a picture of myself and Sean down there on the bottom of the screen. And uh, what we do occasionally is we do a bit of very geeky geography walk, really, along the seafront. We stop in various different points and, and I ask Sean lots of questions. And for the most part, he's able to answer me. But at some times when even he shrugs his shoulders and says, yeah, I don't really know, understand. But in general, the next slide, we hope, uh, will explain what we believe happens along Southwold's coastline and how we um, over time have developed our understanding of what we think is happening here. And hopefully this will help with your understanding of what's happening along Southwold Pool too. So we've got a aerial view here of Southwold and uh, I'm going to slowly kind of annotate this to make it into a bit of a diagram to hopefully explain what we uh, are confident is happening with Southwold's coast. So to start off with, um, you can see that I've added a label there that says no sea defences. Well, there's no sea defences to the north of Southwold. Eventually, um, beyond Southwold's main kind of pier tourist car park, seawall stops and the rock groins stop. And we have a stretch of coastline, which is about 10 to 12 miles or so up to lower stop, next nearest town, which is undefended. And as I mentioned, the, the coastline there is made up of sandstone and clay, and it's easy to erode. And so as a result, in this part of Southwold, and on that stretch of the coast all the way into the distance, we've got no sea defences, and the cliffs there can be eroded. Not all the time, because the sea doesn't always make it up against the base of those cliffs, but in stronger um, storms, and particularly in the winter months, that coastline can get eroded. And as I mentioned before, between about three to five metres worth of erosion generally happens each year along that stretch of coast. So what happened is that material then collapses from the cliff and then over kind of subsequent tides, the sea is able to claim that material from the beach and pull it into the sea. And uh, that's uh, kind of a collection of material then that is then added into the seawater and is transferred and transported generally in a north to south direction. So along the East Anglian coast, there is a tidal current that moves from north to south, so a southerly drift, which moves offshore of the towns and the, and the, the coastline here, and it moves material generally in a north to south direction. So that's the kind of the natural tidal movement that happens along the East Anglian coast. Now, that almost acts like a conveyor belt, really, moving material from the north to the south. And it transfers that sand basically along Southwold's um, kind of shoreline until eventually it comes on its journey across various things that might intercept it and stop it. So in Southwold's case, one of the things that does that is the River Blythe, which enters into the sea about a kilometre south of Southwold's town. And you can see represented by those blue arrows there, that's the kind of the tidal, um, or I suppose the river flow, the, the current of the river coming out into the sea. And in effect, what that does then is it intercepts this conveyor belt current from the, from the north. And it means that the material that is being carried in this southerly direction basically gets cut off by this river current. And therefore, there is a location towards the um, kind of the, the south of Southwold, in front of Southwold Harbour entrance, where there is this current which is essentially kind of blocked. And that means that material that is being carried by the sea at that point loses energy and then sinks to the bottom of the sea. And over time, that creates what's known as a sandbank, a, you know, a big collection of, of under, underwater sand. And actually, at times when uh, we have a particularly low tide, it's possible down at the, uh, the south end of Dean's Beach to kind of paddle out to the sandbank and almost kind of stand up waist high in the water, even though you might be kind of a couple of hundred yards off the coast. So we have this kind of area south of Southwold where there is an offshore sandbank. Now, when we have our general prevailing winds and waves approaching Southwold, they generally come from the south and they move over this sandbank 
And as a result, they slowly push and shunt that material towards Southwold. And that's why the beach at this end is wider, because that beach is being kind of stocked up by the sandbar sand that has been kind of accumulated out here and uh, is, is generally kind of then shunted or by the, the kind of the prevailing wind and, and, and wave directions. What happens then is that we have a wider beach at this southern end and then the prevailing wind and wave directions mean that that material then over time is then transported by the process of longitudinal drift with the squash and the backwash, squash and the backwash towards the pier and in a northerly system further than the pier towards eastern Badlands and perhaps back to where it started from. So we almost have this kind of clockwork cellular system that is operating along the coastline of Southwold Seafront, which is quite rare, really, and is almost how you know a sediment cell would, would operate, this kind of transfer of material. But this is doing it within a much more localised um, area, perhaps an area of, of maybe about a mile and a half or so, where this is existing and operating. So that system is, and, and, and this image is, is provided in your booklet here, but that system is resultant or the creator of the shape of Southwold Beach. That's why Southwold has a wide beach in its southern end at the Dean's end and why it then tapers towards the pier and gets progressively narrower. And as I say, that image and also the image that's on the top right hand side of the screen, which is explaining Southwold's beach shape, is provided in the book that, that you should have. Now, this is just to go a bit further. It's, it's making exactly the same point, really, but just from a different angle. And it just might help you um, further kind of understand that system that I've just um, suggested, because I think it's important to understand that if you are going to do a coastal study. It's important to try and have an understanding of what's, what's going on along Southwold shore. So as we just mentioned, we have this conveyor belt drift of sand that operates offshore of Southwold that moves material from places like Lower Stofton in between to Eastern Bavance, all the way down towards places like Essex along the East Anglian coastline. Now, one of the things that is significant in Southwold is that conveyor belt of sand is it's stopped by the River Blythe current that comes out here. The River Blythe comes out at the end of the Dean's Beach and it can intercept that sand. And as we've mentioned, it creates this sandbank that exists. That sandbank then is basically a big buildup of sand that is there for the taking, really, for waves to move that sand ashore. So when waves approach Southwold, they tend to come most often from a southeasterly direction. They come over that sandbank and they drag that material to the southern end of Southwold seafront. And then over time, what happens is that material bit by bit is progressively moved in a northerly direction by the process of longshore drift, which operates along the shore of Southwold. Now that process results in normally Southwold's coastline looking like this. And if you look at that image, particularly the image on the right, the main image on the screen there, you can see that the groins have got more material on their southern side than on the northern side. And that's suggesting that the material, therefore, is being trapped on the southern side of those groins and is therefore being moved towards the camera in the north. The beach is wider at the southern end, although it kind of looks, I suppose, relatively the same as it does at this, this northern end. The perspective is slightly skewed. But at that southern end, where the dunes are in a distance, the beach is much wider there than it is in the foreground where the pier is. Where the pier is here, the beach in places would probably only be five to ten metres wide. Down where the uh, the dunes are there in the distance, be maybe 50 to 60 metres wide. So it's significantly wider at that end. So there's much more sand and material at that southern end. And progressively, less and less of that material is on the beach as you go further north. And the beach tends to get narrower. So nine times out of ten, that's how Southwold Beach looks with more sand on the southern side of the groins, suggesting longshore drift operating in a northerly direction. And if you look at a groin from the seafront as you walk along Southwold's beach, most days it would look like that image on the left-hand side of the screen there, where you've got, as I say, more sand built up on the southern side, much less sand on the northern side. 
Okay, so hopefully that's given you a bit more of a, an understanding as to how Southwold's beach looks, because I'm, I'm presuming most of you guys won't have ever been to Southwold and, and, and won't have ever seen physically in person what the beach looks like. So that's hopefully given you a bit more of an understanding as to how the town beach in particular looks, um, and also just trying to explain why it looks as it does. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Southwold's beach, like any beach and any coastline around the country, doesn't always behave the way in which we're expecting it to. So there are some days where there'll be waves coming at us from the north and there'll be more sand on the northern side of the, the groins and less on the south. And the, the, the kind of the shape of the beach looks completely different to how you might expect it to. Now, that might be the case when you arrive in Southwold, you might think, oh, what's going on here? He's completely told us the wrong thing. Well, that's not necessarily the case. It's just saying that nine times out of ten, it looks like it does in that previous slide. But depending on what's happening in terms of the weather and the tides and the days before you come, it might well mean that the beach actually is looking slightly different. But it will just be able to explain that by using secondary data to explain why the beach has, has changed shape. Um, so there are a number of different things that you can investigate from a coastal perspective in the South World. And what I'm going to do now is just kind of list these themes, really, that students tend to use as the basis for their study. So initially then, as I've mentioned, there's obviously lots of opportunities for doing studies that are based around looking into the success of the coastal management in Southwold. Some students will focus perhaps looking at the success of the hard engineering and their studies will be looking at the trying to prove the success of the seawall and also perhaps trying to prove the success of the wooden groins and maybe even the rock groins too. It's worth me mentioning though that the rock groins, which are north of Southwold's pier, are much more difficult to measure and to include in the study, mainly because the access to them is so much more difficult. So it might well be that you're able to take pictures of those rock groins, but actually in terms of measuring them, there's maybe only one or two of them that you could actually use. And in terms of measuring sand accumulated against them, it's really difficult because they're much more difficult to walk on. And I wouldn't advise that at all. They're probably only good for doing things like observational studies, like looking at taking photographs of them or maybe doing things like bipolar surveys of them, but actually measuring the rock groins is almost impossible. So some students will focus their investigation on trying to prove the success of the coastal management that exists in the Southwold. It might be that you literally just kind of nail down into looking at the success of the groins and your study is fundamentally based around, you know, the impact that the groins have on Southwold's beaches purely positive, are there negative aspects to it? And it might be that your study is literally based around the groins or maybe even the contribution of the seawall to Southwold and its identity. It could be that that's, that's something that you want to explore. Um, those images that we talked about uh, a couple of slides ago where we were talking about the movement of material around Southwold shoreline and linking it into the sediment cell, is quite a nice basis for a study and some students actually quite like that idea of this circular movement of sediment around Southwold shoreline and they do measurements to try and prove whether that actually does exist by measuring perhaps at the southern end of Southwold beach and progressively measuring as they get further north towards the pier and perhaps beyond show how the beach is getting narrower, how deposition is reducing as you go further north and perhaps also looking at the movement of currents by doing things like orange drift tests as well. So some students base their studies around trying to prove the existence of the sediment cell. Others, perhaps from a more kind of uh, human geography angle, look at coastal assets and how the coast creates an identity in Southwold. There are a number of different things that create Southwold's identity, the, the brewery, the high street, but also the beach is really significant in shaping Southwold's identity and it, it's kind of brand really. So people look at that idea and perhaps explore that idea about how Southwold is, is linked to the coastline um, and how it influences and shapes the identity and function of the town. Other people might look at perhaps coastal assets such as the pier and maybe try to uh, build a study around you know, the role of the pier or maybe the success of the regeneration of the pier. Um, the the seawall itself is a coastal asset and we've actually had students in the past that have done studies purely on the contribution of the seawall to Southwold. Perhaps looking at its kind of physical angle in terms of how it defends the town and you know the confidence that the town gains from the seawall but also looking at it as more of a kind of a social space as well. You can 
seen up necessarily from this picture, but whenever you come out to South on a sunny day, the, the seawall is littered with people taking a seaside stroll. Uh, it's very much a social space um, in the South Bold. It's got all the beach huts lined up against it. Again, on a sunny summer's day, most of those beach huts would be full with people sat outside them in their deck chairs. And, you know, again, that kind of very civilised atmosphere is created. There are um, beach huts with um, cafes dotted along the, the seafront as well. So the sea wall actually really contributes to South Bold as an asset. And it might well be that a study that you're wanting to do is based around the contribution of one of these coastal assets to Southwold as a whole. Um, the shoreline management plan in Southwold, so the coastal management that we have got, has massively contributed, has completely contributed to the variations in beach morphology that we have along the coastline. So the way in which Southwold's beach looks is completely as a result of how that coastline is managed by humans. And so some people like to look at this as a, a kind of a foundation for their study. They look at what the shoreline management plan is and how that's basically created variations along the shore. So the morphology refers to the shape and the size and the nature of the beach. And Southwold's beach isn't consistent. It's not one of these beaches like a kind of a Miami beach, I suppose, that is exactly the same you know, 10 miles, every, you know, if you have to sample it every 10 miles into the distance, it would look exactly the same, same shape, same material. South Bold Beach isn't. Within the quarter of a mile, it varies massively. It has a different size. It has different kind of beach material on it. And it has, you know, different levels of popularity as well. So um, this end of the beach that is shown on the screen here is generally really popular. It looks pretty nice. The sand looks nice and kind of clean and fluffy. And Kind of pebble free whereas further north the beach definitely doesn't look as nice there's more pebbles there's less sand there's less of it um the access is less good and there are far far less people on it so looking at the variation of south Wales beach along the seafront and some kind of um you know tweak or, or adjustment to that is is a really nice investigation that is definitely feasible within south Wales because there's such variation within a short scale and that kind of links, I suppose, to this one as well. Um, a number of students that come to us do look at how various different parts of the coastline vary and, and perhaps do a comparative study where they might be looking at maybe the difference between the um, soft and hard engineering approaches. Maybe their study is literally looking at the variations in beach morphology between North Beach and Town Beach, or looking at the variations between Dean Beach and Town Beach. Um, so, Again, that might be looking at the physical aspects of the beach, but it also might be looking at public engagement with the beach as well. As I mentioned, the, the kind of southern end of South Wales Beach at the beginning of the seawall where the, the, the Dean's Beach begins is South Wales kind of most Instagrammable spot. That area there where Gun Hill Beach Kiosk is, is really popular. And also the town beach is popular too, but there are parts of South Wales Beach that are not popular at all. And you don't ever see pictures of them on Instagram because they look pretty grubby at the, the eastern Bavance end at the northern end of the the, the north beach at the, the north side of the pier. Um, there are parts of South Wales Beach that are definitely not as attractive and, and not as well um, kind of perceived publicly. So some studies could try to create a comparison between different parts of the beach and look at how those areas vary. Um, and again, I've kind of mentioned it a couple of times, but there are a number of kind of human angles that you can do looking at the South Wales coastline. It doesn't necessarily have to be all measuring uh, aspects of the beach. You could look at the levels of, um, you know, public engagement, the impact that coastal management has on, on public perception. How do people perceive different parts of South Wales beach? How do people perceive the sea defences? Do they prefer the, the soft engineering approach? Use at Dean's End is that backed up by increased footfall and increased kind of social media um, tagging of that part of the beach and reduced footfall in the northern part of the beach. So there are a number of different angles that you could take when you're investigating South Wales coastline from the very traditional evaluation of the coastal management here to the perhaps more modern and less traditional um, investigations that might be geared around public engagement levels of the beach. So that again is in your booklet, I think this slide here, but it might be worth perhaps pausing on this at some point, particularly when you're uh, 
thinking about your starting point for your study, because these are basically the starting points. Uh, these are the, the kind of the themes that exist along the Southwold shoreline that you might choose then to use as the basis for your starting point of your study and advising a title. Okay, uh, so this is kind of the halfway point. Um, hopefully it won't take quite as long as I have done for the first half, but what I want to do now is just to spend a bit of time going through the individual methods of data collection that you can use on Southwold's beach. Now, it might be the case that for this next bit, you can literally just kind of pause and skip to the bits that you think are going to be relevant, and you don't necessarily have to sit through and listen to, to me droning on about all 16 of these. But um, one of the things that you'll need to think about when you're doing your, um, your planning is what methods of data collection am I going to use, and which of those are going to be relevant to the study and the title that I've set. So generally, I would say that most studies should include between four to six different methods of primary data collection. So you're going to need to think about that. Have I got enough different methods of data collection which I can use to help me answer my study? Back up the things that I'm saying, a lot of the, um, the methods that I speak about are again in your booklet. So make sure again that you've got that handy and you can use that at a later point as a bit of a reference. Okay, so on the screen here, we have got a box of 16 different data collection methods, which are all appropriate to use on Southwold's Beach. One of the things that I would say before I say anything else about kind of explaining how you can potentially use these methods is that one of the things that the examiners are keen for you to do is to obviously make this your own independent fieldwork investigation, and that includes adjusting and adapting methods of data collection that you might be encouraged to use. So for all of these that I'm going to talk through, you might think, oh yeah, I could maybe use that. That's great, and, and, and do so, but also think about how you might kind of customise those methods to make them more bespoke to your study, how you can make them a little bit more independent and unique to you. A lot of these methods are traditional ones that geography teachers and various different fieldwork providers up and down the country will use with loads of different students. But there's also quite a few here that we've just created and we've made up based on just what we think we could measure on our beach. Um, things like the beach quality survey is something that we've just created. Um, the beach footfall comparison surveys is something that we've just created. The seafront front property quality survey is something which is kind of fairly unique to Southwold. Um, so there are lots of ideas here for different methods of data collection, but don't be afraid to tweak them to make them more bespoke to you. That's Anyhow, we're going to go through these four at a time. As I say, you can pause, skip, and uh, move on to the ones that you think are going to be relevant. First up, a uh, really straightforward observational survey. This is located in your uh, booklet. So you've got the page that you can see on the screen there with the two grids and the radar graph on your in your booklet. Um, bipolar surveys are really good for coastal management studies. It's the opportunity for you to basically score the quality of the coastal management, which you can see. So um, it's a little bit similar to an environmental quality survey or a property quality survey, which you might have done in the past. Um, but it's a way in which you stand next to a, a sea defence, you work through a range of criteria, and you score that sea front, or you score that sea defence against that criteria, sometimes on a scale of one to five, which is what the example is here. It could be whatever, the scale could be one to 10, it could be completely up to you. The example that we've given has got eight different criteria. Again, you could have 10, you could have four, it's completely up to you, and you might choose to um, change the words and adapt the language and the, the, um, the criteria that we're using there. So a couple of things for each of these I'm going to go through and, and think about a couple of things that you might want to just consider. Uh, the first one that I've already mentioned is maybe consider adjusting the scale to suit your study and the criteria as well. Uh, you might want to think about where you will do these. So if you're doing a study assessing the coastal management in Southwold, it may, might well be that, for instance, you don't just do one seawall bipolar survey because that would then be assuming that the seawall is in the same condition throughout. So if you just did one bipolar survey of the seawall, 
you couldn't then confidently say that one bipolar survey done in that one spot is a true reflection of what the seawall is like across the whole kind of mile of its length. So what you'll need to think about is how many times along the seawall do I need to do a bipolar? Maybe I do it three times, maybe I do it five times along the seawall in different locations. But that's going to be up to you. And the same would be exactly relevant for um, the wooden groins and the rock groins. Are you just going to survey one wooden groin and is that going to be sufficient or would you actually be better surveying all of them or perhaps a selection of them? So you're going to need to think about where you will do these and how many that you're going to do. The other thing that this method is, is kind of inevitably um, a victim of is, is it's obviously quite subjective. It's a type of survey that is based on your opinion. So could you potentially look at trying to improve the reliability of this by getting other people's opinion? It's not necessarily the easiest thing to ask members of public to do, but if you're working in a group of three, then why not ask the people that you're with what are their thoughts as well? Because it just means that that gives a, a broader opinion uh, or you know broader broader objectives and, and uh, contributions than just your own opinion. The other thing that's uh, definitely worth noting is wherever you do a bipolar survey, take an image, take a photograph of that scene that you're surveying, because you'll then be able to have that image next door to your presentation. If you choose to do it on a radar graph, for instance, you'll be able to have that image next to the radar graph, which is playing the results of it. Next one, uh, longshore drift test. Uh, some of you might have done this before. It's a bit of a classic coastal geography method. This it's essentially where you throw an orange into the sea and you watch it move along the shoreline. Uh, some people tend to do this longshore drift test without too much thought. They get an orange in their hand, they lob it into the sea as far as they can, and they're just kind of quite happy smiling at it as it drifts away on the tide. Uh, so you need to think about how you can make this longshore drift test work for you. So obviously it's very good for looking at the uh, evidence of longshore drift, but sediment cells and also the success of groins. So a couple of things. Um, first of all, I just explain the methodology of longshore drift test. What I'd suggest is that you start off standing on the shore um, with your orange in your hand and also a phone in your hand with a timer set. Throw the orange out into the sea. I would suggest that you only throw it between five to ten meters out into the sea. And at that point you then need to start your timer. You also need to make a note probably with a stone or your bag or something like that as to where you've released that orange on into the sea from. So that's your mark, first marker point. Your job then, over a set time period, it might be two minutes, it might be five minutes, it might be one minute, but your set time period, your job is to basically follow that orange as it moves either north or south along the coastline. After your time frame is finished, you then need to stop your timer and in line of where the orange has drifted to, mark another place on the sand, maybe another bag or another big stone, and then use a tape measure to measure the distance between those two points. That then tells you how far that orange has drifted within that set time frame. So that then gives you the opportunity to work out your velocity. So that will give you your speed at which the orange has traveled, but also it's important to know whether it's gone north or south to give you the direction of where the orange has traveled. With any of you wanting to do this, if you're not completely sure, obviously, on the day, just ask me and I can demonstrate this for you. But the idea generally is that longshore drift is normally stronger um, where the groins are not on South Bogs Beach. So at the Dean's Beach, for instance, where the, there aren't groins there, generally the longshore drift there is stronger and the orange moves faster than it does than on the town beach. On the town beach, we've got groins. And one of the things that the groins are designed to do is to try and create deposition and stop the sand from being just transported away. So one of the things that the groins do by jutting out into the sea is they intercept the longshore drift currents and they actually slow the water down a little bit and therefore encourage a bit more deposition. So what you'd expect is there to be a, a difference between the velocity of the orange on the town beach compared to the velocity of the orange on the Dean's beach. So it might be useful then for you to do a longshore drift test in a variety of different locations, some where there aren't groins, some where, where there are groins. So uh, you would then need to think about, OK, well, how many of these tests do I need to do? Where do I need to do them? Um, do I need to do them 
at different points during the day. If I'm planning for two days, do I do them on, on two different days? One of the things that is, is worth saying about a long tour drift test is that it's obviously going to be affected by weather conditions, but also it's going to be affected by tidal conditions when you do it as well. So the results that you get won't be consistent. And therefore, the more the, the more of them that you get during the time frame that you're in Southwold, the more reliable your results can be. Uh, it might be worth also noting uh, the latitude and longitude of where you've done each of those tests, because it would later enable you to present them on an ArcGIS map, which I'll talk about in the next video. Um, you've got a, an example of that on your page there, uh, which is a way in which you could present these results. But a longshore drift test, quite a nice, fun thing to do. Worth saying a couple of ethical considerations. We use an orange because it doesn't matter if we're unable to retrieve it. Uh, it's much better than using like a floating plastic bottle. Um, but it's also um, perhaps worth noting that uh, yeah, the orange is, is is kind of more of an ethical thing to have on the beach uh, with, with dogs and things walking around. We wouldn't want those picking up a plastic bottles. So oranges. Okay, there was something else I was going to say there, but I completely forgot. <laughs> Next one. Uh, these two we've mer merged them together. Uh, beach width and seawall measurements. Uh, these are good for studies on sediment cells, differences in beach morphology, effectiveness of drawings, and comparisons with different parts of the beach. So, beach width is simply, as you can see from that image next to my head there, um, that's literally where you measure the distance from the seawall to the shore. Um, yeah, the thing I just just remembered it, it came back to me. The longshore drift test. The thing that I was going to say is that you don't need to retrieve the orange. Um, that's why we use oranges because it means that we don't need to retrieve them. So don't worry about wading into the sea and going to retrieve that orange. Again, one of the reasons that we use oranges is that we can kind of dispose of them, um, you know, without feeling guilty that we we've let them drift off into the sea. So don't worry about retrieving them, and that's kind of a you know obviously a health and safety thing. Anyhow, back to the beach width measurements. Beach width is the measurement from the seawall down to the shore. And what you'll see is that there's definitely a, a difference um, down at the Dean's Beach that's much wider. The further you get to the pier and beyond, that gets much narrower. And that also then gives us um, evidence to show that there is more deposition at the southern end and progressively less deposition at the northern end. That's perhaps suggesting then that the groins are impacting uh, upon the beach and perhaps causing beach starvation and contributing to less and less sand making it towards the north. Sea wall measurements confirm the exact same thing. So the sea wall measurements will also tell us that there's less sand further north you travel along the beach. And as you can see to the by the image above my head, this one here, um, that measurement is literally you just measuring from the top of the sea wall down to the beach level using one of our retractable rulers. Now, what I'd suggest in terms of these is that you think about how many of these measurements you want to do and where you do them. It's worth me mentioning at this point, again, I've said it a few times, the seafront from the pier to the Dean's Beach is almost exactly a kilometre long. So what a lot of students choose to do is kind of systematically sample the beach width and the seawall measurements at 100 metre intervals or maybe 50 metre intervals along the seafront. But to do that, they use one of these beauties. This is something called a trundle wheel. We've got some amazing trundle wheels. We've got the Lufkin 5000 model, which is a superb model, glides along the concrete. It also goes across the, the beach as well, if you wanted it to. Um, but what the trundle wheel does is it measures your distance. As you push it along, a little kind of meter um, ticks over and it tells you how far you've traveled. So you stop that every 50 or 100 meters, and then you can do your beach size measurement at that point and you can do your sea wall height measurement at that point. OK, uh, again, I'll take pictures of each spot that you survey and uh, it says there, could you improve the reliability of your results by using more than your own opinion? OK. So uh, next screen, you might um, choose to uh, pause this. this. Some of these on here might be relevant to you. Uh, some of you, if you've been doing studies in biology, might have used one of these things, a quadrat before. Um, so a sand to shingle sediment analysis survey is quite useful if some of you are doing studies looking at maybe the impact of the groins or looking at the comparisons of different parts of the beach. 
So one of the things that you'll notice as you get to know South Falls Beach is it's sandier towards the southern end. And the further north you go towards the pier, there are more stones on the beach and there's more kind of um, accumulations of shingle. And that's largely as a result of the, the groins intersecting that shingle much more than it is possible down at the southern end. So the coastal management basically is changing not only the morphology of the beach, but also changes the sediment that is on the beach. So the groins are definitely impact upon that. So one of the things that you can do is one of these quadrat surveys. Um, I haven't got a picture of our quadrats, so I've had to use one of these random pictures, I'm afraid, from the internet. But the quadrats that we have are 10 by 10 square grids. And essentially what you can do is you can lie them onto the beach like this. And the idea of the sand shingle survey is you count up out of those 100 squares then that the quadrat has, how many of those squares are predominantly made up of sand and how many of them are predominantly made up of shingle. What you'll find is that towards the Dean's end of the beach, it's almost probably 95 plus percent of those squares are predominantly sand and maybe only 5% shingle. By the time you get to the pier, it's probably more like 60% shingle and 40% sand. So there's a considerable difference as you move closer towards the pier. One of the things that you could do and go take this further is you could use calipers or rulers to measure the size of the pebbles and you could look at how they change in terms of their shape and the size of them as you perhaps move along the pier, um, sorry, move along the beach. And again, like this person has done here, it would make sense that if you're doing one of these surveys that you perhaps take a picture of the frame that you're surveying, which might enable you to do it perhaps in more detail um, at a different time. Um, but yeah, it's quite a useful, straightforward uh, method, this, the sand to shingle sediment analysis survey, where you're looking at how the material on South Falls Beach changes perhaps on a, um, a journey from one end to the other. Next one, quite a classic one in South for this, groin height measurements. Uh, for this, you'll need a tape measure or a measuring stick. And the idea here is that you measure essentially how much sand is built up against both sides of the groins. Now, if you can prove that there is more sand on one side of the groin than the other, then you can prove that the groin is doing its job because it's preventing longshore drift. You're also able to prove the direction at which longshore drift has more recently been operating in as well. You've got more sand built up on the south side. That means that the material is moving in a northerly direction is getting trapped by the south side of that groin. So you're able to learn quite a few things by doing the groin height measurements. Um, but in essence, you're able to prove the effectiveness of the groins. If they are stopping the movement of sand, then you're proving that the groins are being effective because that's one of their fundamental jobs. You need to think about your methodology then and how many times you might measure down the groin, where you might choose to measure. Some students might measure the length of the groin and then maybe divide it by five and systematically measure down the length of the groin. Others might more just kind of spontaneously just measure at different points of the groin, maybe one towards the top, one towards the middle, and one towards the shore. Your methodology is going to be your choice. Now, I'm just going to flag at this point, I won't mention this too long, but some of you might be interested in doing a statistical test to prove the um, results that you gather. And I would suggest that at this point, it's worth me mentioning a test called the Mam Whitney U stats test, which might sound completely alien to most of you. But the Man Whitney U stats test is a really good statistical test trying to see how different two sets of numbers are. By that, I mean that ultimately by doing groin height measurements, you're going to get a lot of measurements from the north side of the groin and a lot of measurements from the south side of the groin. And what you might choose to do is average those out. So you've got an average north side measurement and an average south side measurement. You might then be able to confidently say, well, my north side measurement is bigger than my south side. That shows that there's a difference and that shows that the groins are working. That's OK. That's fine. But what a man with new stats test does is it makes more kind of a scientific um, ultimate answer than that. Because the problem with averages are is that they can be distorted by kind of freak anomaly results. Um, and so actually a man with new stats test would give you a more reliable kind of definitive answer as to how different the numbers are between your north measurements and your south measurements. Just throwing that out there. Um, but some of you who are particularly interested in proving the reliability of your results might choose to speak to me about that during your visit. If you're doing groin height measurements, come and have a chat with me and say, oh, I've done groin height measurements. I saw in your video you mentioned man with new stats tests. Would you mind just you know, um, talking to me about it and talking me through it? 
be more than happy to do that. Okay, uh, you need to think a little bit about how you record your groin height measurements in your book, but there's a very simple example that we use here. You've just got a north side um, column, a south side column, and uh, generally I'd suggest that it's most appropriate to measure this in centimetres. I wouldn't have thought you'll get many readings that are more than two metres, so it will be between zero to two metres, and therefore I think it's probably more appropriate that you measure in centimetres. This example has got five different measurements. It might be that you choose three, it might be that you do 10 off each groin, it's completely up to you. Seafront property quality survey is good for assessing the effectiveness of the seawall. So there's a number of things that we can do to kind of prove the effectiveness of groins. It's quite straightforward, simply just by looking at groins, they're working and they're doing their job of intersecting um, in some instances. But actually trying to prove the effectiveness of the seawall is trickier. It's harder to try and prove how good something is at stopping erosion, because if it's stopping erosion, you haven't got anything to measure. But one of the things that you could do here is, is you could bring in a kind of a human geography method, uh, which is this property quality survey, which I'll talk about to the people interested in the human investigations. Now, one of the things that I showed you earlier is that in 1905, Southwold had big storms that were battering the coastline and were constantly kind of eating away at Southwold shore. Now, if you owned a property in 1905 along Southwold seafront, you'd have probably been pretty terrified at the start, but you wouldn't have had any confidence at that point that your house was going to last into the long term. And you wouldn't have had really much interest in selling it if you were to put it on the market because nobody would buy a house that's about to fall into the sea. However, Southwold seafront houses now are definitely some of the most desirable and certainly some of the most expensive in the town. And that's because since 1905, a huge amount of concrete has been added to the base of Southwold cliffs in the shape of our sea wall. And that sea wall is a robust, resilient defence against the sea. And it means that basically the people that own property behind it are protected and their properties are protected. And so the people that own those houses aren't just happy and feeling safe that they're not going to be falling into the sea but they've got confidence that they can invest in those properties and gentrify them and maintain them and extend them and improve them. And actually the quality of Southwold seafront houses is as good as any of the houses on any of the other streets. And that shows that there's as much confidence in the sea defences in the, in, on this uh, property uh, in, the, in the front of Southwold as anywhere else in the town. So you can actually complete a seafront property quality survey at potentially several different locations along Southwold's North Parade, the, the kind of the seafront um, street. And that would show, I would have thought, high levels of property quality. And that in itself shows that the owners of those properties have got high levels of confidence in the seawall and that their house isn't going to fall into the sea. Now, one of the things you could do to kind of extend that is you could maybe look at another location and there's a couple in, in Norfolk and there's, I'm sure a couple in Essex as well that are coastal communities that have got seafront houses that aren't protected by seawalls. And as a result, the owners of those properties over time haven't invested and improved the properties. And you end up with these kind of beach shacks, almost kind of like chalets, really, that aren't as expensive and are definitely not as desirable. And you therefore might be able to do a kind of a comparison using something like Google Street View of the property quality survey in Southwold in comparison to the property quality in somewhere else. And that would then prove essentially the confidence that people have in the seawall at protecting Southwold. <laughs> like that all makes sense. Uh, just as a point of interest, one of the things that you could also do if you wanted to uh, when you're in town is you take a photo of the, the lighthouse. Southwold's lighthouse was built in the 1880s, maybe the 1890s, but anyhow, it was built before the seawall was built. And that's why Southwold's lighthouse is quite rare, is, and because it's set back, about two streets back from the seafront. Most lighthouses are set out on, you know, points that are right out at sea or, or right on the cliff top. Well, Southwold's isn't. Southwold's lighthouse is, is set back from the beach, uh, probably about 30 or 40 metres, I suppose. And the reason for that is because when it was built, if they had built it on the cliff edge, it probably have only lasted a few years. So they built it set back from the cliff edge quite a long way because they wanted it to last into the future. 
Southwold's lighthouse beam, by the way, stretches for 26 miles. It's impressive, isn't it? That's was irrelevant, but I just thought I'd throw it in there. Anyhow, uh, beach profiles, next one on this page. Beach profiles are a classic that a lot of geography teachers love. Uh, I've got a bit of a love-hate relationship with beach profiles. They serve a purpose, but one of the things I don't like about beach profiles is that they tend to take people ages to do them. And sometimes people do loads of them and they're not quite sure why they're doing them. The first thing I would think about when or I'd ask you to consider if you're doing beach profiles, the first thing I'd ask anyone is why are you doing a beach profile and how is it helping your study? Now, beach profiles can help your study. They are good for looking at um, comparisons between different parts of the beach. They're also good at looking at how the, the groins in particular change the shape of the beach. And they do definitely in Southwold. So there's definitely value to using them um, in Southwold. But think about how many realistically you need to do. I have had some students in the past that have spent a whole day doing beach profiles and have come back with kind of maybe 15 or 20 different beach profiles. And that's their, their main thing that they've done. So think about whether that realistically is something that you need to do. How many do you need to do? How much time are you going to budget for doing them? Where are you going to do them? There's a couple of different techniques in your booklet that you're given. You have got um, a technique that we normally use with GCSE students, which is measuring from the beach backwards. Some people might choose to measure from the seawall down to the beach, uh, down to the shore. Up to you, really, as well. And there's also different ways in which you can sample whether you actually go for kind of a systematic approach where you divide your beach size into equal intervals or whether you use a different approach where you measure the angle and the, the, the kind of the distance between each variation in beach shape along the beach. So there's a couple of ways of doing beach profiles of all of the different methods. This is normally the one that I, I tend to try and demonstrate to people in person on the beach. So if you're doing that, and uh, you know, you're know you arriving in Southwold on the morning of your visit and you're not quite sure about how to do a beach profile, seek me out and I'll come and, and demonstrate it to you. Uh, the things that you'll need, there are two ranging poles, they're red and white poles. You'll need a tape measure and uh, something else called a clinometer. We've got all of those things, so you just need to make sure you put those up um, before heading out onto the beach. Okay, uh, next couple of ones, speech footfall survey. Uh, again, a bit of a human geography method, this one. This is good for studies on the impact of the groins, and it's also good for comparisons between different ends of the beach. The reason for that is there's a couple of tweaks you can do with the beach footfall. So one of the things that you could look at is just simply how does footfall vary along Southwold shoreline from one end to the other? mentioned previously that the Dean's end of the beach and the Gun, Gun Hill end of the town beach are very popular, very civilised, popular dog walkers, popular as family, families, nice, accessible, open beach, generally are busy with people. However, as you move towards the pier and definitely beyond the pier towards Eastern Balance, the popularity of Southwold's beach gets definitely significantly less. Now that's largely as a result of the access, the access is less good and also a result of the lack of material on the beach at that end. And so the, the beach profile or the beach morphology impacts upon the popularity in terms of footfall of people on the beach. So you could look at that potentially. And I think again, in your book, that there's an example of somebody that's done that and they've systematically along Southwold shoreline done essentially pedestrian counts. The other thing that some students have done in the past, which I think is quite nice, if you're looking at potentially the um, the impact of the groins is that one of the problems of the groin is it creates a physical barrier to material and it tries to trap material as it's move, being moved along the shore but it also creates a barrier for people so there are steps over the groins at the kind of the, the seawall end of them but if you're walking along the shore then you have this kind of barrier that you have you kind of have to clamber over so actually one of the things that we find in Southwold is it tends to be that when people come to the coast and they generally come to the coast with a bit of a stroll along the seafront, is that actually quite often people prefer to stroll along the prom, which is on top of the sea wall, rather than actually walking on the beach. And certainly they do that more at the town end. So at the town end where we've got groins, there's less footfall along the beach than there is further away from the groins where there aren't groins and people can more easily walk along the shoreline. So, you might choose to do a number of different kind of footfall surveys, looking at how that varies around Southwold's beach and how potentially the groins impact upon footfall actually along the beach 
on Southall to Town Beach. Just an idea. A nice way of getting it perhaps more of a human method in and another angle looking potentially at the impact in terms of access and popularity of the groin. Beach quality survey. I mentioned this earlier that this is a survey that has been designed by us based on ideas that we've got from other surveys that we do and, and other things that you can do in different locations. And this is the type of thing that you can absolutely customise to make unique and bespoke and more relevant to your study. It's again, one of these kind of bipolar surveys with a range of criteria and a spectrum of scoring, and you essentially just score that um, depending on, on how you see fit. Again, you might think about how you can make this more reliable. Maybe you could ask the public to contribute to this. And you also might want to think about how many times you do this and what different locations. It's a nice survey that um, you know is, is a good way of getting some qualitative data for um, for coastal studies. Mood mapping is also kind of a qualitative method as well. Quite a uh, a vague method, perhaps. <laughs> uh, mood mapping. Um, just to kind of give you a bit of an overview of this, this is something that has been based on. Um, work done by psychologists i think in america or canada but essentially their their idea is that anywhere whether it's inside or outside has got an, a mood or an atmosphere that you can kind of attribute to it. what they've done is they created this kind of spectrum of a hundred words which you can see on the screen there and they're all emotive words they're all words that are describing atmosphere and emotions and the idea is that in any given location you select the word that you think best fits the emotion of that place or the atmosphere of that place and you then ask other people to contribute to that as well. And you build up a picture of what that atmosphere is like to different people. So there's no reason why you couldn't do this in Southall because, again, as I say, one of the things that we've got in our favourite Southall is we've got one end which is really civilised, really natural and really popular, the Dean's end of the beach or the, the Gun Hill end of the town beach. And then north of the pier, we've got an area which is not popular, which nobody takes Instagram photos of, which hardly anyone goes to. And has definitely got a different atmosphere the opposite end of the beach so actually doing something like a mood map where you're trying to get people's opinions of how that place feels is actually quite appropriate and it could, could work and students in the past have done this and it, and it does work quite nicely so you need to potentially think about whether this could work for you um, whether you could tweak the mood um, kind of grid the word grid to be more bespoke to you. We've, we've got an example in the book that we, we kind of slimmed the original one from 100 words down to 25. But again, you could make that into whatever format you want. We've seen students in the past that have kind of created the spectrum, had it on a piece of A4 and have literally just gone up to members of the public and have said to them, can you select the word that you think best fits the atmosphere or the mood of this location? And they literally just point to one and kind of vote like that. But you might say, pick the three words that you think best fit. Again, wherever you're doing that, um, get photographs of the place and you also would be probably wise to do things like taking a screenshot of the weather conditions maybe using a weather app on your phone because those kind of external influences will affect the mood that people have um, on that any given day finally social media analysis this is something which i suppose potentially is more feasible to be done um, in advance of your trip or you know doesn't necessarily have to be done in southwold but these are good for, again, looking at the uh, the impact of coastal management and the different ends of Southwold Beach, looking at the uh, the public perceptions, how people are engaging with Southwold. Um, you could use Twitter, but one of the things that we've been kind of doing more recently is using Instagram. And um, Instagram obviously gives you loads of, of images. And if you go onto Instagram and search for various hashtags, you get an idea about what people are saying about certain things or certain places. So simply by just doing a search for Southwold Beach, you then get all of the posts that people have tagged hashtag Southwold Beach in. And um, you probably can't see because my head's in the way, but I've got loads of pictures there uh, that people have tagged Southwold Beach in. Now, one of the things you could do then is you could analyse those pictures. You could maybe select 50 or 100 of them, and maybe the first 50 or 100 that, that come up. Um, maybe you could then copy and paste them onto a Word document and create almost like a mosaic of images. And from that grid of 100 images or 50 images, you could then do some some kind of analysis. You know, how many of those images are showing a beach? How many of those beach images are showing things like the groins? Because if they're showing wooden groins, you can work out there on the town beach. If they're showing 
sand dunes, you can work out there on Dean's Beach. They're showing rock groins, you can work out there on North Beach. So you could actually start to build a picture of what proportion of those pictures that are tagged with Southwold Beach are actually showing different parts of the beach and therefore showing how people are varying their engagement levels within different parts of the beach. And I would have thought, and we've done this several times before, normally when you do this, it shows that there is significantly higher levels of engagement in the southern end of South Falls Beach. And generally, the, the further south you go, the more Instagram posts there are. Uh, and it, very, very rarely do you see anyone taking a picture and tagging it with, with Eastern Balance or, or North Beach in. So it's, it's a nice tool that you can do again a bit of a qualitative method of, of data collection that you could do for a coastal investigation. Last ones, I promise, and again you might just kind of skip through these. Um, photographs, I mentioned them before, try and take photographs wherever possible. You can use them in your introduction but you can also use them to explain your methodology too but you could also legitimately use them as a piece of data collection. Some of you might be well into your art and be happy doing things like um, field sketches uh, but some of you might be much more into photography. Now, these are good for pretty much every single study. Uh, if you have got a good image, you can then annotate that image and bring it to life to show the things that are relevant to your study. So, for instance, the picture that we've got on the screen here is an aerial picture of Eastern Babins, showing an area of erosion, showing an area of DIY sea defences and showing the extent of Southwold hard engineering. And the arrows are highlighting particular points of interest and the, the words are annotating um, the detail of what's going on in those different locations. So you try not to use just one word labels. What you try to do is bring that image to life by using annotations. And I would suggest that yeah, genuinely, I think probably most people should include two or three annotated photographs of their fieldwork sites or the, the sites that are important to their study within their NEA. I think it's just, it's a, it's a no brainer to use a couple of annotated photographs to show the key locations within your study. An extension of that is um, in your booklet, you've got the example of doing past and present photographs. There might be some locations where you're able to, before you come, perhaps get two or three archive old images, maybe of the pier, maybe of Gun Hill, maybe of the beach at the Eastern Balance, and maybe you're then able to, in your in your uh, day when you visit or your couple of days when you visit, you're able to replicate that image with a modern day photograph. And then you could do a comparison between what has changed and what's remained the same between those two views, if that makes sense. So those, those kind of past and present photos, a nice way again of, of kind of highlighting the change that might exist in your study. Whew, we get in there. Okay. Um, Next one, seafront activity mapping. This is basically, I put this next to the annotated photograph because it's kind of the same thing really, but just of a tweaked extension. Um, this is nice because it generally involves taking a seat, sitting down somewhere where you can see lots that's going on. So maybe sitting on the seafront, maybe sitting on this, uh, one of the benches above the seafront on Gun Hill, maybe sitting on the pier, maybe just kind of propping yourself up against a groin on the beach. But activity mapping is where you are encouraged to just kind of sit for maybe 10 minutes or so and make short, sharp, snappy statements, maybe only a maximum of 10 word statements about the people in that area, not about them in terms of personalities, but in terms of how they're engaging with that space. And by that, I mean, you know, you might write down three ladies pushing pushchair walking down South Bogs Prom. You could have elderly couple, um, wading into the sea going for a swim you could have a young boy flying a kite of his dad um, so you make these short snappy statements about how people are using that space and then you're able to layer those statements at a later point either onto an image that you've taken of that location or you're able to perhaps put it onto a, maybe a base map like the example shows on the screen here um, so this again is, is really useful in terms of kind of painting a portrait of the landscape that you're investigating so if you're doing a study where you're looking about public perceptions or maybe the total assets and identity theme that we mentioned earlier, then doing some activity mapping would be quite a useful thing and it can add then to your photographs that you've taken. Again, you might want to think about adding details like the time of day, weather conditions, maybe the directions that you're facing when you're taking the images to. Okay, penultimate ones, these last two, we've got these um, in the last couple of pages of the booklet. Oh, there's my dog. Just stay there a minute, notes. 
Now we're just coming in. <laughs> okay. The last, the penultimate one, cost benefit analysis. Uh, this is good for um, looking at trying to actually assess whether the money spent on a sea defence has been money well spent or not. So it's a way in which you try to um, you try to kind of add up the expenses of the coastal management projects, and you try and counterbalance that with whether that money that has been spent has been justified or not by trying to prove how much um, money it has saved. So a cost benefit analysis is something that I would I would sit down with you and I'd, I'd kind of talk you through uh, in person because what it involves is using up to date figures in terms of erosion rates, but also it re would require you to find out the current average house price in Southwold. Um, essentially, we're able to fairly approximately um, work out that the cost of Southwold's coastal management is in the range of about twenty five million pounds. So. If we can work out how much of Southwold is being protected by that £25 million worth of sea defence, we are then in a position to be able to say, yes, that is money well spent, or no, it isn't money well spent. Because if the £25 million of sea defences is protecting property which is worth more than £25 million, then it's money well spent. If it's only protecting property that's worth £5 million, then it isn't money well spent. So. There is a way in which we can do this. Uh, you've got an example which a student did about five years ago, I think, uh, in, in your booklet. But it's the type of thing that I would sit down with you and I'd, I'd talk this through with you if it was something that you were uh, interested in doing. And it requires quite a bit of um, secondary data, but that's fine and I can talk that through with you. Flood risk mapping is mainly relevant really for students that are looking at um, perhaps impacts of sea level rise or maybe the threat from storm surges in Southwold. Um, but there are definitely different parts of Southwold which are more at risk from flooding than others. Um, Southwold's town itself is built on an elevated uh, area of high, higher land. Uh, the area to the north and to the south, Ferry Road and um, Eastern Ballant are perhaps more vulnerable. So flood risk mapping is all about trying to find which parts of Southwold are more vulnerable to coastal flooding than others. And again, there's a bit of a methodology in which you can do this. There's ways in which you can make this methodology much more unique to you. And again, a bit like the cost benefit analysis, if it's something that you think would fit in with the themes of your study, talk to me about it when you come and I'll sit down with you and we can talk through potentially how this could work for you. Finally, I kind of said finally, didn't I, on a previous slide, but let's say finally on this slide, because these are two that I hadn't mentioned earlier, but these are two that you could definitely think about, particularly if you're coming for two days, or particularly if you feel at the end of your first day, if you're just coming for one day, that you've got everything done. These are two things that you could definitely try and explore. A questionnaire doesn't have to be something that has been planned for weeks and has got 20 questions in it. It might be something that you just do spontaneously you maybe only include two questions within it. So a question that can be only one question. But what I would say is that pretty much all studies, I can't think of a study that wouldn't benefit from getting some form of public opinion, whether that's talking to locals, talking to second homeowners, maybe talking to visitors to Southwold. By engaging and getting other people's perceptions about the issue that you're investigating can only help enhance you know, the reliability, the contributions that you've got to your study. So if you can gear up enough courage to speak to members of the public, I would suggest do it. It's also worth me saying that generally the visitors to Southwold are people that are a bit older. They're generally quite nice as well. We don't get much kind of riffraff. You don't get like the hen do, stag do parties, big groups of young people in Southwold. Generally the people that are here are quite pleasant and are quite up for a chat. And as I say, there's a lot of older people that are quite happy to answer some questions, particularly if it's only a couple of minutes and it's only a couple of questions. Now, you might want to think about what type of people you approach. Now, um, obviously, you want a kind of a, in an ideal world, you want a kind of a, a spread of people of all ages, all ethnicities. Well, you're not going to get that in Southall. You're going to get quite a distorted um, population in Southall. The people on the image here, I can use that image because those are my parents, that's my daughter. But if I didn't know those people, I would probably feel quite comfortable about approaching them. For a start, one of the things that they've done, which is good, is they've sat down. So it tends to be people that are sat down are much easier to approach because they've already stopped 
And actually, if you're trying to get questionnaires down on a high street, it can be quite a tricky thing to do because people on a high street are generally there with a purpose. They're there to get something. They're there shopping and they don't always want to stop and, you know, spend more time doing that. But if they're sat on a bench looking at a view or tucking in some chips like these guys are, then they're probably going to be more inclined to answer a few questions from you. So think about who it is that you approach. Think about fundamentally what questions you're asking. Because very often with a questionnaire, people can fill them up with questions because they think, oh, they, I've got to have 10 questions. And those questions, therefore, aren't always relevant. So if you've only got two relevant questions to ask, only have two questions in your questionnaire. But it might be that you've got four or five. That's fine. The key thing is, is every question in your questionnaire should help you answer one of your sub questions or should help you answer your title. It needs to definitely be relevant. If it's not relevant, don't ask it. Is it relevant to ask someone's age? Probably not. I can't think of any study, really, it might be, might be some human studies, but I can't think of any coastal studies where it's going to be relevant to talk to these people and say, can I ask you how old you are and where you live? There's no point in it. It starts off on a bad foot. So think about what questions you're going to ask. Maybe have a mixture of open and closed questions. So some questions that give them the opportunity to speak longer and to answer with more uh, information and some questions that which are perhaps more snappy things yes and no answers or maybe scoring things from one to ten for instance now you might stumble into somebody who is a fountain of knowledge who is a gold mine of of information on south world and in that case don't be afraid particularly if you're getting the, the sense that they're you know nice and friendly don't be afraid to ask them whether you can use the recording function of your phone to actually record the conversation because you might be desperately trying to scribble away all the stuff that they're saying all these gems that they're giving you and it might not be possible to keep up so you might just say actually i'm really interested in what you're saying would it be possible actually if i used my phone just to record some of the things that you're saying so i so i can um, make sure i don't miss anything and they can only say no so um, potentially use your phone as a transcript tool if you, if you need to, as a recording tool if you need to, and you can write a transcript from it at a later point. So those are questionnaires. As I say, how many questionnaires do you need to do? There's no set figure. If you only ask two questionnaires, it's better than asking none. But if you ask 50, that's fantastic. It depends on how much um, kind of weight the questionnaire is, is adding to your study. If your study is kind of based a lot around people's public opinions, then obviously you want to make sure you're getting plenty of questionnaires. But it might not, but it might be that it's just an add-on that you've decided to do in the last half an hour during your trip and, and actually you come across a couple of people that you want to ask about coastal management and you've got some input from them so there's no set amount of questionnaires that you need to do and, and basically any that you can do is, is going to be a bonus um now there'll be some people hopefully that you come across who you think actually this person's a local or this person seems to know their stuff. Maybe a questionnaire for them is, is a bit of a waste. And actually, perhaps just having a longer conversation, a more informal conversation with this person might be more beneficial. So having interviews or informal conversations with people who are knowledgeable about local issues is a great source of information. And it might not fit neatly into the box of a, you know, the, the classic kind of data collection method. But actually just having a chat with people about your issue is, is going to be useful. So there are a number of businesses, particularly the local uh, independent businesses, who have got staff who may be willing to speak to you. Now, it might well be that you go into a shop and you see that that shop is really quiet. You might go into this, this cafe here, Nine Belly, and see that James there is, is really quiet. And you take that opportunity to ask him a few questions. Um, that's a kind of a spontaneous way, way of doing interviews. But it might be that, for instance, you want to actually uh, more definitively have something organised. So perhaps it could be an idea that you maybe look at arranging a couple of interviews, maybe just one interview with somebody in Southwold before you come. For instance, uh, for instance, this chap here, James from Nine Delhi, has got an Instagram account. It might be that you're able to send him a message, maybe an email to say that James will be coming in a couple of weeks' time. Would it be possible to pop in at 10 o'clock for a five minute chat about um, one aspect of Southwold? And I would have thought he'd probably be quite open to that. But it might be that you pop off that message to a couple of people to try and arrange maybe a couple of chats. Um, but as I say, 
don't be afraid to try and arrange and um, organize interviews or try and just spontaneously do them as well because the worst that you could you know get in response is somebody just saying no sorry i'm a bit busy and in that you know on that point obviously if you go into a shop and it is really busy then it wouldn't necessarily be an appropriate place to ask for a, a kind of a spontaneous interview so that's why it might be an idea to try and arrange something previously all right we got there in total that was actually 18 different methods of data collection so some people sometimes think that coastal studies are limited in terms of the methods that you can do a lot you can do with coastal studies but just be a bit creative with it and finally therefore so you guys have watched virtual video one you've now watched virtual video three i know you might be absolutely sick of my voice and think oh, no, watch virtual video four give it a try the virtual video four is going to give you a bit more information about organizing yourself before your visit so actually how do i then uh, design my study and how do i actually go about uh, getting myself ready for my trip to southfold it's been an hour and a half you've done ever so well if you've watched all of that congratulations commiserations to you stuck at it shown good resilience hopefully it's been useful and hopefully it's helpful. okay hopefully see you virtual video four